Welcome to class number 15 in our series on the Gospel of John. I want to welcome all of those that are uh, watching on the internet, those that will be watching the CDs later in the future, those of you that are actually here in the classroom with us. Uh, we have uh, added some extra classes here because we didn't want to race uh, this teaching in the Gospel of John. We're going to go to chapter 19 and I'm going to back up a little bit to review beginning at verse 1. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Uh, scourging was uh, an event that could cause you to die. The Romans wanted you to suffer and not die and so they had a law that you could not uh, bring more than 39 stripes across the man's back and those uh, uh, leather uh, thongs that would come across there with uh, had sometimes pieces of bone or pieces of metal and they would really fillet your back open and uh, many accounts that we have uh, written accounts of crucifixion tell us that sometimes the person's bowels would be hanging out and and uh, first their skin would be cut and then deep into the muscles and then uh, the person uh, generally uh, suffered for a long time and then most likely would still die. So this was uh, something that Christ went through prior to his being crucified. And uh, sometimes we don't uh, hear or see much about the scourging part. And it seems to be here only one sentence where the Bible says, and he scourged him. But uh, that was uh, uh, quite an event and, and a person could die just from the uh, scourging. Then verse 2, the soldiers plated a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And uh, the crown of thorns bush, or at least the one they point out in Israel today, has these long, real uh, hard spikes anywhere from this length to about four or five inches long. And uh, when they would press that down on the head, uh, your face and head is the most vascular region of your body. And, and uh, if you ever cut yourself shaving as a man, you know how it takes forever to stop the bleeding. Well, uh, blood must have poured uh, from uh, the scalp, from the head of Jesus, from the crown of thorns, where the thorns pierced down into his head. Then notice they uh, put on him a purple robe. We know that they taunted him as being a king, and of course purple was the color of a king. And so they put on him a purple robe, and they said, of course, art thou uh, the king of Israel and uh, they mocked him we know that later they ripped that robe off of him and you may have imagined that that uh, robe after having been on him for a while probably blood had clotted to the robe and then they ripped that off and these back wounds would have been uh, opened fresh again after they took off the the purple robe we find here in verse 3, they said, Hail, King of the Jews, mocking him with the kingly robe. And notice they smote him with their hands. And that really means that they punched him uh, with their hands. These are soldiers, strong men, fighting men. And they took their fists and they pounded uh, the face of Jesus Christ. Back in Isaiah 52, there's a prophecy of Calvary, and there it talks about that he was marred uh, from the beatings and that he didn't uh, look human. And, of course, if you've watched a boxing event where somebody goes 10 or 15 rounds, uh, sometimes they're so beat up, their eyes are kind of swollen shut and their faces are distorted and puffed up from the swelling and... They've got cuts and there's bleeding and, and they don't look like the same guy that went into the ring uh, a little bit ago. Well, that's, I'm sure, what Christ's face must have looked like. And the Bible predicted that back in Psalm 52, rather Isaiah 52, verse 12. So we find that uh, Jesus, here in these just couple of verses, went through a great deal before they ever uh, took the nails and drove them through his hands. So they put the crown of thorns on his head. They uh, put on him a purple robe. That was after they had scourged him. And then they said, Hail, King of the Jews. And then they smote him uh, with their hands. They 
took and punched him uh, many times in the face, different soldiers. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that you may know that I find no fault in him. Now that is significant because Jesus is, as John said in chapter 1, verse 29, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb that was to come had to be without blemish and without spot. That means that he was sinless. And here, Pilate was the last of a whole series of inquisitors. We know that we saw here a little bit earlier, they took uh, Jesus to uh, Caiaphas and then to Annas and then back to Caiaphas. And then we read in the other accounts, he was taken over to Herod and so on. And he was bounced around all night long and different people interrogated him. Plus, throughout the week, uh, the Herodians, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, all the different religious groups had their uh, time of examining him, and no one could find any fault. And here we have the last inquisitor who basically makes the pronouncement, here is Jesus, and I find no fault in him. He was without sin. He was without blemish. They could not find anything wrong with him. I think that's very significant uh, because Christ <clears throat> is, of course, the sinless Lamb of God. Why don't we take just a moment and look at a verse in Peter. This is over toward the book of Revelation. And you'll notice over here in 1 Peter, and this will be on page uh, 1312, in 1 Peter chapter 1, page 1312, it says in verse 18, For as much as you know, doesn't say hope, doesn't say guess, doesn't say perhaps. Uh, the Bible is fill, filled with no words. K-N-O-W. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or uh, behavior received by tradition from your fathers, but with what? The precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without, notice, blemish and without spot. So here we have Christ coming as the sinless lamb of God, Pilate making that pronouncement on behalf of the government of Rome. He was the Roman governor. And he says, I find no fault in this man. And then verse 20 tells us, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So before the earth was ever created, God had already planned this plan of redemption. And Christ came and fulfilled uh, this uh, beautiful plan that there would be a sinless Savior, a sinless substitute that would come and die in our place. Then notice verse 5. Then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto the crowd here, Behold the man. And in verse 6, When the chief priests, therefore, and officers saw him, they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. And uh, Pilate said unto them, Take ye him and crucify him. And he says again, For I find no fault in him. Then the Jews answered him and said, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God, which is a phrase that means he claim, is claiming to be God. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and said unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. You know, back in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah, it says that Jesus, the Lamb of God, would be as a sheep before his shearer is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Amazingly predicted that he would not defend himself here before Pilate. And most would. You know, if your life was on the line, you would uh, defend yourself. But Jesus, notice, gave him no answer. Verse 10, Then saith Pilate unto him, Speaketh thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee 
and have power to release thee? And Jesus answered and said, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore, he that delivered me unto thee hath the greater sin. And of course, uh, we find that um, God, of course, delivered him, but also the Jewish people delivered him before Pilate. And we find that this was something that had been foreordained before the foundations of the earth. And from thenceforth, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, <coughs> excuse me, thou art not Caesar's friend. Whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. Now that was the crime for which Christ was crucified. Rome could care less that Christ claimed to be God, but it was treasonous to claim to be a king. And so when he was crucified, they put a sign above the cross that said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. And uh, every criminal, every person crucified had a sign above their cross that uh, would say the uh, crime for which they were being crucified. And his crime was that he was the King of the Jews. So Rome crucified Christ for treason, for claiming to be king, but the Jews delivered him up to be crucified because they said he committed blasphemy, claiming to be God. So we find the Jews wanted to see him killed, but the only way they could do it was to kind of play into the hands of the Romans here and accuse him of being a king and committing uh, treason. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat and in a place that is called the pavement, but in the Hebrew, Gabbatha. And it was the preparation of the Passover. The preparation of the Passover would have been the day before. We believe the crucifixion week, uh, that week, that Thursday was the Passover. Now Thursday, being the Passover, the uh, Passover would begin at sundown, actually Wednesday. And so Wednesday night at sundown began the Passover. It's hard for us to readjust to this kind of thinking because of the way we count time from midnight to midnight. But uh, I always remember being raised down in uh, Miami and I had a paper route where most of my customers were Jewish and when I went to collect the route, I had to collect the money every week, and then I'd pay the, uh, the uh, paper manager. And after I paid all my bills, whatever was left over was my profit. And obviously, I had to get everybody's money, or have had money still hanging out there. I didn't have anything for, for myself at the end of the week until I could finally collect that money. Well, I found out that if I got there on Friday afternoon, which is when I would collect my route, <clears throat> if I got there before 6 o'clock, I was fine. But if I got to a Jewish home after 6 p.m. on Friday, they would say, I'm sorry, Sonny, you'll have to come back because we don't do any monetary transactions on the Sabbath. And I thought at first that they were just trying to renege and not pay on their bill. But anyway, I learned real quickly that if I came back after sundown on Saturday, which I didn't like to do because Saturday night I wanted to be my night <laughs> as a teenager. And uh, so uh, I uh, uh, tried my best to collect early Friday from all the Jewish customers before sundown. Or I had to come back Saturday or catch up another day or even the next week. But uh, it runs from sundown to sundown. So the Passover would have begun Wednesday at sundown and would have run through Thursday uh, till sundown, which would really, for the Jew, be Friday night, and so on. And so this is the way the Jewish people count time. Now, it was the preparation of the Passover about the sixth hour. Now, this is Roman time, and the sixth hour would have been from midnight. So this was six o'clock in the morning, if you're making notes here. Obviously, the Jews had Christ up all night from the betrayal uh, in the dark, in the Garden of Gethsemane, <clears throat> the evening before, uh, we find here he's been detained and interrogated and, and uh, uh, taunted and mocked and uh, beaten up and all the things he went through, including the scourging, 
before 6 a.m. So he was scourged, the crown of thorns, uh, the beating to his face, the mocking as being king, all took place before 6 a.m. Here we have uh, Pilate presenting him now at uh, 6 a.m., Behold your king. But notice, they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. And Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? And the chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. According to verse 14, this took place at 6 a.m. in the morning. So notice, there was a large crowd up at that hour as the chief priests and rulers had instigated a crowd. And there they were early in the morning, wanting to get rid of Christ. And they knew Passover was approaching. And they didn't want it to take place on the Passover. So here they are on the preparation of the Passover. Little did they realize how they were going to fulfill the scripture exactly. That Christ would die as the Passover lamb exactly when Israel would offer up their lamb. Verse 16, Then delivered he them therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led him away. Now there was a distance between the fortress of Antonio at the northern corner of the Temple Mount platform to go through the city streets of Jerusalem to exit the northern wall and there go over to the hill of Calvary and that's where Christ would be crucified. So there were several hours here between 6 a.m. and believe believe he was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. So they had all that time and there's a great procession that uh, walked through the city and we know that he was carrying the crossbar. So what they had out at the crucifixion site was, like the Jehovah's Witnesses say, a stake, uh, a, a stick that went straight up. Then the crossbar was laid on top of that, and that would form like a T, if you can imagine this in your mind. And then when you put the sign above that, it would be, uh, uh, you know, an actual cross. So you'd have the the uh, just the the T like this, but when they put the sign above that then you had an actual cross. And so this is the appearance of it uh, when you get all done. Then it says here, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place. Now, he bearing his cross, he only carried the cross beam, not the entire cross. And uh, that could have been fairly heavy, a fairly substantial plank that uh, his arms would be nailed to, and that would be set on top of the the stake or the stick that would go straight up. He bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull, which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha. So the word Golgotha means a skull. And uh, when you go to Israel to this very day, you can see etched in the face of that hill, the face of a human skull. It really is remarkable because that, I think, identifies it beyond shadow of a doubt is the real place. The Roman Catholics have a place called the Holy Sepulchre, a church where they say uh, Calvary took place, but it's not on Mount Moriah, so that would violate scripture number one, because Mount Moriah was the Mount of Sacrifice, and that's the place where Abraham was told that when he offered up his son Isaac, that what took place there was a, an enactment of what God would do when God would offer up his son on Mount Moriah. So they just have the wrong place. And of course, uh, the reason why they have the wrong place is that what happened was Constantine declared the world to be Christian in the fourth century. His wife, Helena, uh, uh, went all over the Holy Land and she picked spots based on what people would say or uh, maybe a, a whim of hers and said, this is where it was. And so, uh, uh, that was an era of time, the Hellenistic time. Probably studied about the Hellenistic time, but that was because of Constantine's wife, Helena. And uh, she was the one that picked out a lot of these spots, and they made mistakes, big mistakes. You have to remember, several hundreds of years transpired between uh, when it actually happened and when uh, Constantine's wife went to Israel and picked out the spots. So they, they made a number of mistakes as to the real places. Now, of course, uh, when you look at the scriptures carefully and look at the sites, uh, 
uh, you can tell, you know, which is real, which isn't. I think it's pretty obvious. We also know that uh, when you go there, that uh, Mount Moriah is a, a part of the, <clears throat> rather, uh, Calvary is a part of the Mount Moriah mountain. Uh, I got to stand up on top of uh, Calvary, and looking uh, south, you see the wall of the city on the north, and you see just below the uh, uh, wall, the rocks upon which the wall is built, and if you were to take that rock uh, strata and just extend it out, you can see how it was connected to Calvary at one time. But what happened is that they disconnected that highest, most part of that mountain to form a moat or a ravine or a place to uh, prevent an army from taking Jerusalem from the north. Because there were valleys on the east and the west and in the south of Jerusalem. And so Jerusalem was easily defended from those valleys. On the east there was the Valley Kidron, on the west the Valley Hinnom, which Christ used as a description of hell, because the fires of uh, the garbage of Jerusalem were burning in Hinnom. And they burned 24 hours a day. And uh, at different points in history, you can read in the Old Testament, they actually offered up live sacrifices, human sacrifices, in the Valley of Hinnom. And so when Christ talked about hell, he spoke about the Valley of Hinnom, which he called Gehenna, the Valley of Hinnom. Of Hinnom. And he said that hell is like this valley. The only difference is, is that the soul will never die and the fire will never go out. Well, the fires of the garbage of Jerusalem have gone out centuries and centuries ago. There are no garbage fires burning today in that valley. But at the time when he spoke, uh, they knew exactly what he was talking about. A place where there were fires, where they actually did live sacrifices, and uh, they would burn them. And it was a picture, really, of hell. Christ said, hell is like this valley, a Gehenna. And the only difference is, is the fire of hell will never be quenched, and the soul will never die. Christ says that four times in Mark chapter 9, verse 42, 44, and 46. He says, the fire I will never be quenched, and the soul will never die. Mark 9, 42, 44, and 46. So he speaks of it uh, very strongly in that passage and repeats it numerous times. And of course, the valley is not hell, but uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses try, try to make a big argument that it's just talking about a, a garbage dump. And they try to do away with the doctrine of hell. But now you know he's saying it's like that valley, but the difference being the fire would never be quenched and the soul would never die in the final hell. So Christ spoke more about hell than he did about heaven because he didn't want people to go there, and that was the illustration. So we find that there is this skull hill today, and uh, Calvary is um, directly north. What is interesting to me is that heaven apparently is in the north in our universe, and back in Leviticus 111, it says they were to offer the sacrifices northward before the Lord. And so we believe that heaven is in the north, and I have an article back there, and there's a void in the north where there are no stars, and apparently that's the place the Bible simply references everywhere to be where, where heaven is. And uh, they would offer the sacrifices in that direction. So Christ, being offered at the highest most, northernmost point of the Mount Moriah Ridge, uh, certainly fulfilled, I think, that prophecy. So it makes it another reason why this is the uh, place. Also, it was outside the city wall. According to Hebrews chapter 13, Christ was crucified outside the gate of the wall. And so he was not crucified inside the city. Uh, the Catholic site is inside the city. And so it, again, couldn't be the real place. But most pilgrims go to Jerusalem and are taken to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. I personally cough all the way through because of all the incense burning there you can hardly, and the smoke you can hardly see. You need a gas mask and you get, need uh, uh, some way to uh, breathe without choking uh, with all the candles and the incense burning there. Then we find in verse 18 where they crucified him. Simple statement here, but where they crucified him and two other with him, 
And notice what it says here. On either side one, and Jesus in the midst. Was that by accident? I don't think so. I think because this is God's wonderful uh, illustration of everyone that would ever be saved and everyone that would ever be lost. There were two thieves. One believed, one did not. One was saved, one was not. And we find that the divider, the reason why one was saved and one was not, was right there between them. So Jesus was in the middle. And the one on his left hand apparently was the unbeliever and did not trust Christ as Savior. The one on his right hand believed. And Christ told him right there on the cross, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. So that's a great illustration to use when you're witnessing. It's a visual. Everybody can see what's taking place. Uh, two men, both criminals, both condemned for their crimes, uh, both dying for their crimes, being crucified with Christ. And one rejects Christ, one believes on Christ, and the one that believed was saved. Didn't get baptized, didn't join the church. There was nothing he could do to save himself. He simply believed and God saved him. So it's a great, great, great illustration. And I think we don't use it often enough. And some have asked, what about that nine thief? He only had seconds to live after he was saved. How could he earn any rewards in heaven? And I tell people, he has more rewards than all of us. Because how many times has somebody told his story and led someone to Christ? This guy is still racking up points all the time. That dying thief is constantly through his story being told in the Bible, racking up every time I use it, every time you use that story, uh, I think he's getting points uh, for uh, his testimony and trusting Christ at the last minute of his life. And isn't that great to know that it's never too late for someone to become saved? Many times evangelists will say, and they quote from 2 Corinthians chapter 6, now is the day of salvation. And they'll say that unless you respond right now to the Holy Spirit's conviction upon your life and you give your heart to Jesus and come forward tonight, uh, you may never have another opportunity to be saved. And I've talked to people that have walked out of meetings like that and they would tell me they're going to hell. Why are you going to hell? Because I passed up the opportunity that was given to me when the Holy Spirit was moving that evangelist told me that if I turned that down, I could never be saved. I said, well, let me just straighten that out, because that's not true. The dying thief got saved in the last seconds of his life. So it's not true. And how wonderful that is to know. But you might run into people, and it's good to be aware of that, that there are preachers. I think they're so desperate to have a decision in their meeting when they come into a church as an evangelist that they say things really that are not true and threaten and blackmail the people to get them to come forward because the success of his time there is based upon people coming forward. We've never done that in this church. And the reason why is it becomes a trap. Because once you have to have people come forward, then if nobody comes forward, everybody sees the service as a failure and the preacher as a failure and also it makes works a condition of salvation if you aren't careful how you use that. But of course, if people aren't coming forward, then they raise the heat a little bit, as I say it. And they make it uh, more threatening that if you don't come forward, you are probably going to miss your opportunity of salvation. I think it's terrible. And I don't believe that uh, you should ever do that. Now, I've preached in churches where they have people come forward. I remember preaching a revival in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, it was in the winter. I enjoyed my stay up there. It was a very nice church. But I would do exactly as I do right here. But then I would say, if you raised your hand tonight and trusted Christ as Savior, the church would like to give you literature and like to tell you how you can join this church. But you're saved right in your seat the moment you trust the Lord. And so we're all going to stand and we're going to sing, Just as I am, I come. And if you uh, trusted Christ, they would like to give you literature and acquaint you with the church and, and tell you how you can join this church if you'd like to. And we had a lot of people come forward. It worked. It, it was a great week. And, and I didn't have to lie and I didn't have to uh, 
put people under uh, undue pressure to do something that was not true. And I think the preacher actually learned how it could be done a different way because uh, that church tradition was they had people come forward. But I think you can do it in an honest way. Let people get saved in their seats and then tell them that you have literature for them. You've got people up here that will give you literature, acquaint you with the church, tell you about uh, how you can become a part of that fellowship and so on. But I don't like it at all because it seems to uh, be competitive with people getting saved. And so we don't uh, do that here in, in this church. But I thought I'd share that with you because this is what happens in a lot of these churches. So we find here that uh, one on either side and Jesus in the midst. So uh, that was not accident. What if it had been Jesus and then two thieves on his left side? Or Jesus and two thieves on his right side? It just wouldn't have been the same, would it? To have Jesus being the divider. Because Christ is in the middle. He's the divider of all men. We already read in John 3. He that believeth on Christ is not condemned, but he that believeth not on Christ is condemned already. So Christ is the divider between those that are saved and those that are lost, and the difference between whether they believe or whether they believe not on Christ. Then verse 19, we spoke about this title, and Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. That was posted right above the crossbar. And then that would be an extension up and make it an actual cross. If it weren't for that, it would just be a T. But that extra made it, in appearance, a cross. Verse 20, this title then read many of the Jews, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near to the city. Notice it's outside the city, as we said a moment ago. And it was written in Hebrew and Greek and Latin. So he had a lot of uh, press here in words. And it says here, this chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am the king of the Jews. So they didn't want the title to say he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, What I have written, I have written. Pilate wasn't going to put up with any more, and he did not change uh, the sign. So the sign uh, was accurate. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, he is their king. They rejected him. And we know he's coming back again as king and will rule over Israel for a thousand years, seven years after the rapture. So Christ is the king and he's coming back as a king and he will come back as king of kings and lord of lords and rule over the entire earth for a thousand year period, the millennium. Then we find in verse 23, Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart, and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top uh, throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, Let us not rend it or tear this uh, cloak, but cast lots for it. Uh, whose it shall be, that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, they parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. They didn't know they were fulfilling scripture, but it was done that scripture might be fulfilled. And here we have them gambling for his cloak. Isn't that interesting? Psalms 22, 18 has that quote. And that was written a thousand years before Christ went to the cross. You know, if I had to pick out just a couple of prophecies, I think that would be convincing to me that would have to say, I'd have to say the Bible is the word of God. I would say those couple of prophecies in Psalm 22, the fact that his hands and his feet would be pierced in verse 16, the fact that they would gamble for his cloak, verse 18, a thousand years before he ever came, that's quite remarkable. Uh, that couldn't have been manipulated and just happened uh, to fulfill prophecy. It was obviously the hand of God telling us the future before it ever happened. And that's why I became thoroughly convinced very early on that this is no ordinary book that I'm holding in my hand here. This is, of course, a book that is indeed the Word of God. And Jesus Christ is indeed the Savior that would come. And the soldiers here did gamble for his garment. 
Verse 25, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. And it says here, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple standing by whom he loved, which is John, the writer of this very book, John is modestly here talking about himself. He's also the author of the three epistles of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John, and the book of Revelation, which means five books were authored by or written by the apostle John. And it says, When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then he saith to the disciple, John, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. So here we have John the Apostle now being told by Christ to take care of his mother. So Mary now was under the watchful care of John the Apostle for the rest of her life. He became the pastor of the church at Ephesus in Turkey. And uh, when he was exiled for proclaiming the gospel, he was exiled to the island of Patmos, which is about 40 miles off the Turkish coast. What is interesting is that although it's very close to Turkey, that island of Patmos is owned by Greece. And so sometimes I was scheduled to be on the island of Patmos and didn't get to go because I was at Ephesus and I was going to take a boat to Patmos. But Greeks and the Turks were not getting along very well. They don't get along even now, but I mean, they weren't getting along real good at that time for sure. And we couldn't take the boat to the Greek island because of the bad relationship there between the Greeks and the Turks. And I didn't get my chance. I wish I had had my opportunity to go to the island of Patmos. I was really looking forward to that where John received the revelation, the book of Revelation. But in any case, this is probably where Mary died. And there is a place, and I've been there, where uh, there's a church that commemorates her death and the place where she was buried. What is interesting to me is that I also visited in Jerusalem a Roman Catholic place, a church, where they say Christ, rather Mary was buried in Jerusalem. So the Roman Catholic Church says that Mary was buried in, in Ephesus, and they also have a church that says that she was buried in Jerusalem, but also, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that she never died, that she ascended to heaven like Christ. And when you confront them, they'll say all three are true. I mean, this is the craziness uh, within the Roman Catholic Church, because it doesn't have to be connected to truth. It doesn't have to make sense. It's just believed. Whatever the church teaches, you believe. Well, anyway, uh, that was uh, a real revelation, because... I saw the burial place of Mary in Jerusalem, which probably is not true at all. And I saw the burial place in Ephesus, that probably is the real place. And then, of course, I read and study the doctrine that she never uh, died but was ascended, which I reject that that did not happen either. All right, so now we have here uh, John taking care of Mary from this point on. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. So here, one of the seven sayings that Christ said while he was on the cross. There were not many words spoken in the six hours while he was on the cross, but this is one of them. Now therefore they set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it under his mouth. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is what? Finished. And you've heard me talk about that phrase many, many times. And in the Greek, it's one word. So really, this is the shortest verse or phrase in the Bible, because we often talk about Jesus wept as being the shortest. But those are two words in the Greek. And this is one word, but in English expressed in three. It is finished, which is, uh, it means from the Greek word, uh, paid in full, full satisfaction received for the debt. But it's only one word he spoke, and it's an accounting term. That means that salvation was accomplished, that he'd fully paid our sin debt. Then he bowed his head 
And notice it says he gave up the ghost. The word ghost is the same word translated spirit everywhere else. So he gave up his spirit. We're made body, soul, and spirit. Christ also was body, soul, and spirit. And he gave up his spirit or soul or both because he uh, left the body dead and left the body. And uh, he, of course, uh, at this point, uh, uh, then heads to paradise in the heart of the earth. Verse 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation, and you have to remember this is the preparation for the Passover, that the bodies should not remain upon the cross upon the Sabbath day. So they wanted to get the bodies off before the Passover began. And again, this was uh, about three in the afternoon when he dies. So he uh, was nailed to the cross at 9 a.m. He was brought before the crowd at 6 a.m. in the morning after having been scourged and mocked and beaten and all that. He then is uh, uh, brought before uh, the crowd and Pilate pronounces he finds no fault in this man. And then, of course, we know that he releases Christ to be crucified to the mob and they crucify him at 9 a.m. And then we find here that at 6 p.m. in the evening, 12 hours after he leaves Pilate, uh, the Passover began at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, which really is Thursday night, beginning at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. So notice it says here that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. The Good Friday myth comes from this verse. People not reading carefully said the bodies were not to remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day. So they said the Sabbath day is Saturday. If this is the preparation for Saturday, it's Friday. And so this is how the Good Friday error began, which the Roman Catholic Church teaches and most churches believe. I always tell people that Christ was crucified on Wednesday, and so we call it Good Wednesday of the Crucifixion Week, and Friday of that week was Plain Friday. So if you'll notice, how do we know that we're right? If in, you'll look in the parentheses here, <coughs> it says, for that Sabbath was an high day. Now, high there refers it to it being one of the high holy days of Israel. And there are seven. Leviticus 23 names all seven of those feast days, beginning with the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of First Fruits, the Feast of Pentecost, the Feast of Trumpets, the Feast of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. So those were all high holy days, and even though they didn't fall on a Saturday, they were called a Sabbath. So we have here a unique week where Thursday of the week was also a Sabbath because it was the high holy day of Passover. And as the Jews follow a lunar month, it doesn't always fall on a Thursday. It falls different days of the week. And you just have to look every year. I think a year ago or so, it fell the same way it did 2,000 years ago when Christ was crucified, with the uh, Passover being on Thursday. And that means that Christ, therefore, was crucified on Wednesday. And the Sabbath they're talking about is the high holy day of Passover. So they didn't want the bodies to be on the cross beginning by sundown, Wednesday night, which was Passover. So what did they do? They besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and that they might be taken away. And the reason why they would break their legs is because somebody being crucified, uh, there's a number of articles now written by different medical doctors, but they, they demonstrate and show that if you're suspended in this way, uh, you can exhale, but you can't inhale. In order to inhale, you have to push your whole body weight up. And, of course, the two feet at the bottom were spiked together. You can imagine how painful it was to be crucified. For every breath, you'd have to push your whole body weight up on a spike that held your two feet. And the pain must have just been riveting through your whole body as you pushed up uh, to catch a breath. And eventually, the one being crucified... Uh, uh, couldn't do it anymore. They just ran out of strength. And then they uh, slumped and they suffocated and they died. Well, the way they would speed it up was they would send soldiers out and they would take a, a board like a baseball bat, I would imagine, and they would come and they would swing it across their knees and break their legs. 
And uh, so that's exactly what they did here. And as soon as the legs were broken, the uh, person being crucified would just dangle. They couldn't push up anymore, and they would suffocate, and crucifixion would come fast. So then came the soldiers. Here they come with some equivalent to a baseball bat. And they break the legs of the first thief, and then, excuse me, and the other that was crucified with him, they broke his legs. And when they were come to Jesus, they saw he was dead already, so they didn't break his legs. Isn't that interesting? So Christ already died. Why would he have died before the others? Because look at what he'd been through. He was scourged. That was enough to kill somebody by itself. So here he is, was scourged. In addition to that, he had to carry that cross beam. He didn't carry it the whole way. You might remember he stumbled and they required another man to carry it the rest of the way to the cross. But he was exhausted. He'd been up all night as well. And uh, he was absolutely exhausted. And so he died first. And the two thieves died after Christ. And we find here uh, that it says here in verse... Uh, 36, for these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. Psalm 35 said, not one bone in the Messiah's body would be broken. What if the soldiers had uh, swung at Christ's legs and broke them? Scripture would have been wrong. It, it would have been violated. Isn't that amazing? I mean, what is the possibility of all this taking place? The soldiers managed to get there after Christ had died. If they'd gotten there a little bit earlier and he was still alive, then they would have probably broken his legs and the scripture would have been broken because it would not have uh, been true. But the scriptures were fulfilled that not one bone in the Messiah's body would be broken. I think that's amazing. And we also find here, but uh, they didn't break his legs, verse 33, but one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith there came out blood and water. And that, of course, speaks about how the death has already occurred, because the serum uh, part of the body or the blood separates itself out, the plasma from the, from the, uh, the hard part or the uh, red corpuscles uh, separate out, and so it appears to be uh, watery fluid and then the blood being the other part. And whenever that happens, you're dead, because that's what happens after death. So this is a confirmation in the Bible that uh, Christ had died, because uh, some have imagined that he swooned, that he somehow revived in the tomb, but it's clear he was dead. And then, of course, to leave no question in our minds, we find here that uh, the spear here uh, caught up into the heart area of his body, all the body fluids poured out on the ground. So he was, you know, bloodless. And obviously, uh, bloodless, he, he was dead. And uh, we find here, he that saw a bare record, and his record is true, and uh, he knoweth that he uh, saith true, that you might believe. For all these things were done, that the scripture should be, should be fulfilled, a bone of his should not be broken. And another scripture, which said, they shall look on him whom they what? Pierced. So the scripture said they would look on him whom they have pierced. Turn, if you will, back to Zechariah for a moment, the next to the last book in your Old Testament. Zechariah, and this is chapter 12 that we're going to, page 977. <coughs> page 977, Zechariah chapter 12. Throughout this whole chapter, it is not Zechariah that is speaking, but it is uh, God himself. Verse 1 of Zechariah 12 says, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel saith, not Zechariah, but verse 1 of chapter 12 of Zechariah, page 976 says, saith the Lord. And then throughout, you'll notice verse 2, Behold, I will make Jerusalem. That's the Lord. And in that day, verse 3, I will make, that's the Lord. Verse 4, in that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every horse, and so on. And so throughout here we find it is God who is speaking through the prophet Jeremiah, Zechariah. And in verse 10 it says, I will pour, 
upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This is quite a remarkable verse because who is speaking, Yahweh or Jehovah? When was Yahweh or Jehovah ever pierced? Well, when he took on a human body, when he came the first time, and in that human body, he was pierced. But now it's leaping ahead to the second coming, when Christ will come back, and they will look upon him whom they have pierced. So Christ will come back, and he'll still be in the same body. And the wounds of his crucifixion and of the piercing uh, by the Roman soldier will still be there in his body. And they shall look on me, he says here, whom they have pierced. And they shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son. And shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. This is talking about the second coming. And when Christ comes back, he will fight for Israel and defeat all the nations that surround Israel and the nations around the world and set up his kingdom. Look at verse 9. It shall come to pass in that day, referring to the day of the Lord, the thousand year days and the seven years of tribulation that preceded, that God says here, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That hadn't happened yet. That'll be at Armageddon. And when Christ returns, and then he says, I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace. Talking about those that have believed on him that are saved. And they will actually see him coming back and look upon the one that the Jewish people had pierced when he came the first time. An amazing reference <clears throat> and definitely a proof for Jewish people that the Messiah not only would be pierced, uh, but also would uh, obviously be seen in that body that was pierced when he comes at his second coming. Very, very powerful witnessing verse uh, to talk uh, to Jewish people with. All right, back now to uh, John's Gospel. Verse 38. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews... So here again, there are such a thing as secret believers. I found comfort in this because I was a secret believer for a whole year. I trusted Christ and <clears throat> didn't let anybody know. And my sister, who had brought me out to the Bible study where I got saved, was really anxious to see me get saved and was really looking for any indications or signs, even that I liked the Bible study. But guess what? I didn't give her any hint <laughs> that anything had taken place. And I feel badly now because, uh, really, she was so hoping I would get saved. And I did get saved. But I walked out of there showing no evidence. I never raised my hand. I never wiggled my eyelashes. I never did nothing. I never, you know, wiggled my big toe. There was no evidence. I walked out of there giving the appearance that I was the same guy that walked in there. And uh, it was almost a year before I revealed to anybody that I had gotten saved. So I was a secret believer. But God brought me to the place in my life where I dedicated my life to Christ and I began to open my mouth. But there was a whole year when I was totally secret. Here in the Bible we see that there are secret believers. I was one of those. I knew that if I told my sister, kind of the world would know. You know. So I couldn't possibly let her know. Because that would be just like announcing it on national television. My sister would have made sure the whole world knew. Uh, and I wasn't at that moment prepared for anything like that because I knew what would happen. She would have done that. And I knew it. And so there was no way she was going to find out. And I was a secret believer. But there are secret believers. And uh, I don't think that's the right thing to do. But I just want to point out that there are such things because some people feel like well, you can't be a secret believer. You have to, uh, as some evangelists say, you have to publicly confess Christ or you won't be saved, that Christ will not stand for you at the judgment. So here we have Joseph of Arimathea being a disciple of the Jews, but secretly, or Jesus rather, 
uh, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus, and Pilate gave him permission. He therefore came and took the body of Jesus. And then it says there came also Nicodemus, which is the first came to Jesus by night. So here we have two secret believers teaming up. Uh, remember, Nicodemus came by night in John 3 and gets saved. And here's Joseph of Arimathea. And they came here by night, or rather he came by night when he got saved and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pound weight. So here's the preparation now for Christ's burial. This had to be quick. Christ dies at three. They apparently had already gotten permission, so as soon as he died, they took his body shortly after the thieves were killed, took his body down, and they hurriedly prepared it for burial. They took the body of Jesus, verse 40, and wound it, wound it, wound it, wound it. I hope you get that, because the Shroud of Turin cannot possibly be true. The Shroud of Turin is one big cloth. Supposedly the latest body on his image was transferred to the cloth. They wrapped him like a mummy. Notice they wound him in narrow linen strips. They wound him, they wound him, they wound him, they wound him. I hope you mark that in your Bible. So they wound him up in linen strips and they took this myrrh and aloe mixture and when they would wet down the linen strips and wrap it around the body, then they would smear more on it and then wrap it further and smear more myrrh and aloe. And they say that this stuff, when it dried, would set up like concrete. So Christ was encased in, they say, maybe 40 pounds of linen strips and 100 pounds of myrrh and aloes that's 140 pounds. If Christ was a 200-pound man, we'll just do that for simplicity with math, that would be a 340-pound arrangement when you got all done. A 200-pound man being wrapped with 40 pounds of linen and 100 pounds of myrrh and aloe, uh, which would set up like concrete. So this is certainly not the Shroud of Turin that you hear about. Uh, and that's uh, phony baloney. I subscribe to a magazine that when I tell people what it's called, it causes eyebrows to be raised, it's called uh, Bar. And you almost think, well, what kind of a magazine would a preacher get like that? But it stands for, it's an acronym for Biblical Archaeological Review. And it has all kinds of information about it, all the latest digs in Israel, lots of beautiful pictures like National Geographic in that respect. And it's uh, published up in Washington, D.C. Very nice magazine. They had an article uh, and I have all the copies for about the next 15 years packed. But uh, an article that was published not too long ago, uh, several years ago now, where uh, they had done some research on the Shroud of Turin. And they said they had a forensic scientist examine the cloth, and he determined there was absolutely no evidence of blood anywhere on the cloth. No blood. Zero blood. And he also determined that it was painted <clears throat> onto the cloth, uh, and that the paint pigment was of the kind they used in the 13th century when the Roman Catholic Church was at the height of, of uh, showing off relics, different things that people could see that would, of course, bring faith, they said, to people. And they still do this in Europe a lot. They bring out the relics every year. They have so many pieces of the cross it would require a forest to produce them all. It gets a little bit ridiculous. And uh, they have all kinds of uh, things that they consider are proofs. Well, it's, it's actually recorded in history. And they quote uh, the quotes from Pope Clement of the 1300s when this Shroud of Turin was produced. And they uh, said that when they wanted to display it, he required that a priest would announce loud and clear that this was a representation of the burial cloth of Christ. Well, it wasn't even that because it was not the linen strips. But they, they knew that it wasn't the real burial cloth even back then. And the paint pigments was exactly of that era. So you can just lock it into time. That's when uh, they used that kind of uh, paint pigment. And, of course, there was no blood on it. And then by the carbon-14 method, they date the Shroud of Turin to the 1300s. So... Uh, it's clearly not it. Plus, it doesn't meet the biblical description. Because if it were biblical, uh, uh, it wouldn't be one big cloth. And then another big one, which we don't have time to cover right now, 
is that it has Christ with long hair. I believe Christ had short hair. All the paintings of Christ with long hair are wrong. It says in 1 Corinthians 11, uh, 14, does not even nature itself teach you that it's a shame for a man to have long hair? I don't think Christ would violate his own word and wear long hair. And some say, well, wasn't he the only guy who had long hair? You know, the hairstyle in the time of Christ was set by the Romans. The Roman Caesar cut was short, off the ears, off the neck, comb forward, short bangs. That was the popular cut. If you were a man, you went to the barber shop, and the barber were to say, what kind of haircut would you like? He'd probably say, I want that Caesar cut. Every, every man wanted to be like that. And they all had short hair. And they said, what if Christ was the exception and he had the long hair? Then why did they have to pay Judas? They would just tell the soldiers, find anybody with long hair, cuff them, bring them in. You got the man. He had to walk over and actually embrace him and kiss him to identify Christ because he looked like everybody else. They all had short hair. That's why that painting in the Last Supper is all wrong. They got everybody with long hair. All the paintings down through uh, the, that we have today around are all wrong. Uh, Christ had short hair. That was the style of the time of Christ. And so uh, I believe uh, we've been misled in all those areas. So the Shroud of Turin is not right. Christ was wrapped in little London strips. We have to take our break and we'll come back and do class number 16.